Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, boy, this seems like a big auditorium, but we were going to be really, really cramped at the RISA location, so, so thank you for moving over here. Um, it's nice to see so many parents and students, and we're so happy to have our welcome and honored guests. Thank you so much. My name is Kathy Busticker. I'm the parent liaison for um, St. Clair County Know How to Go. And um, we do programming. Our main programming is Parents, Kids, and College. We do that at every high school. College survival kits for 11th graders at every high school. Um, and then these Ask an Expert series that we have occasionally. And um, we have some other kind of important programming coming up. We have ACT prep. Juniors and sophomores can um, practice for that all-important ACT. That information is in your booklet. You'll see it there. Also, just for your information, um, Port Huron Northern um, just no reason, just that they have for the last eight years has put together um, 12 students who will pay a larger amount of money and hire the Princeton Review to come in. So if anybody's interested in a more extended ACT prep class, um, call the Princeton Review and find out about that prep class at Port Huron Northern. Um, if they don't get 12 kids, they don't run it. So it's kind of why I want to put it out to you guys in case you're interested. It's kind of a parent-driven thing. So anyhow, since I started this job six years ago, listening to parents and the kinds of things that they're looking for and students and what they want to know about, what comes up quite often is the confusion and the anxiety and the desire to want to become a doctor or a dentist. And then the fear of, well, I don't know what to do and that sort of thing. So for many years, I've wanted to have an ask an ex an expert program like this, but I didn't really have the wherewithal to be able to pull it off. But now, I have a new colleague, and her name is Dina Norad, and she comes to us um, as our higher education consultant at St. Clair County Know How to Go with um, a background in college admissions for four years at a sweet private college in the middle of uh, Michigan, and also um, uh, background in medical admissions um, at a medical school here in Michigan. So we're very proud to have Dina working with Know How to Go now, and she's your facilitator tonight, and I want to introduce you to, to uh, Dina Noran. Well, good evening, and I couldn't be more pleased to be facilitating this panel tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of, of why we decided to put together this group tonight and what our, our desire and view is for this, and then we'll, we'll dive right into questions so that you can start to begin to form your own questions uh, to, to grill our panelists here. So. I wanted students and parents to understand the process of applying to medical and dental school, so I've asked our experts to join us to share their perspectives. Uh, Lauren Flanagan and Ann Schneider uh, represent uh, the admissions side of the house. They are uh, admissions representatives from the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine, as well as the Michigan State School of Osteopathic Medicine. I also wanted students to understand what it's like to be in the field. So we invited two practitioners from the dental field, Dr. Dave Lamanzi and Dr. Yundi Saman, to help share their perspectives on what it's like uh, in the real world working in the practice. And then we also wanted the student perspective, as you all will have to uh, head through medical school and your undergraduate degrees and so we asked several students to be here so Travis Washington is a second year student at the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine and then we have Jesse Yarbrough and Sarah Burke from the Michigan State School of Osteopathic Medicine and they're also in their second years so I will turn it over to our panelists and they'll share a little bit about themselves and uh, their organizations and then we'll dive into questions. Lauren, if you want to get started. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me in my microphone? No? Okay. Can you hear me now on my microphone? <laughs> oh, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Again, my name is Lauren Flanagan. I work as the admissions coordinator at the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. Um, I 
I'm not quite an expert yet. My background is undergraduate admissions, and I've been with OUWB um, for about eight months now. So I've learned a lot, um, but I certainly can guide you through the process um, of what it, you know, what it takes to apply to medical school, and hopefully I'll see all of you in several years when you actually are applying to medical school. Um, a little bit about OUWB very briefly. We are a privately funded medical school. We are on the campus of Oakland University in Rochester, so about an hour from here. We are in our third year right now. Um, we have three classes of students and we are pulling in a fourth class of students at the moment. And um, we're a, a great little school. So I don't wanna go into too much detail at this point. You know, part of why you're here is to get a broad overview and to get your wheels turning and to get started. So I don't wanna to delve too much into about our school. Um, but certainly if you have questions at any point, you're welcome to contact me. Thank you for being here. Hi, uh, my name is Travis Washington. Um, I'm a second year medical student at OUWB. I am from Port Huron, Michigan. I went to Port Huron High School. And uh, so it's glad to be, you know, I'm glad to be back here, glad to see you guys, you know, are interested in, in the medical field. Um, I went to undergrad at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Absolutely loved it. And so yeah, now I, again, now I'm in medical school and Hopefully I can help you guys, you know, kind of figure out the plan and the path that you guys want to take. Hi, I'm Ann Snyder and I work for Michigan State College of Osteopathic Medicine. We have, have uh, pulled in about 325 students into our school every year. And out of the 325, uh, 200 are housed at the East Lansing campus. We also have uh, it, four years ago, because we have about 23, 24 of our base hospitals out in southeast Michigan, we put a medical school in the heart of the Detroit Medical Center, and we put a medical school on the campus of Macomb Community College. So, uh, in the, on the campus of Macomb Community College and DMC, we house 50 students. So we would have 50 first year, actually, and 50 second year. Um, and so you could actually uh, go to school where you could go to community college at Macomb or a local community college, transfer to Wayne or Oakland for your, um, you know, get your upper level sciences in, and then, um, then if you're selected for our, our class, you could uh, go to school at Macomb and DMC, so closer to home if you choose to do that. Uh, we also have 25 students that we pull from uh, a Canadian initiative, so just from Canada. Um, and so that's kind of how our, we typically get around 5,000 students that apply and we get about 325 students. So, but the neat thing is, is that you can actually come locally and go to college. Hi, my name is Jesse Yarbrough. Um, so like she was saying about being local, I was, grew up in Richmond, Michigan. I started uh, going to school at Oak, uh, Macomb Community College and then transferred to Oakland. So when I became aware of Macomb campus, it made perfect sense for me to you know, try to stay local. So I'm kind of a non-traditional student. I worked in construction for 10 years before I went back to school. You know, and then I decided that I really wanted to do medicine. It was, you know, it was great to be able to do it, you know, right down the road. Either Oakland are just great having these schools around here. Um, so it's been nice. I mean, I'm the second year at uh, Michigan State along with Sarah here, and it's a great experience. I mean, hopefully you guys are here to, we can tell you the stories and it's a lot of fun and it's really hard, but it's, it's good. So thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah Burke, and I went to high school in Fraser, and then I did my undergrad at Michigan in Ann Arbor as well. And um, I actually got my undergrad in art and design and women's studies. So then when I decided I wanted to go to med school, I had to go back and take all the science prerequisite courses. So I took those, and then I found a new home at MSU Com. So. Hi, my name's Dave Lomazny. I'm a practicing dentist in Port Huron. I have been practicing here since uh, 1998 when I graduated from the University of Michigan Dental School. I'm also a 1986 graduate of Port Huron Northern High School. So I grew up here as well and did other things like some other students. I have undergraduate degrees from Western in French and accounting and I worked as an international auditor for a big accounting firm on the East Coast for a while, and then went back to school and uh, did some undergrad work and then went to U of M. 
and I am very happily practicing family dentistry here in Port Huron, raising my two daughters. Hi, I'm Renda Jindi Saman. I am also a practicing dentist in Port Huron. My story is a lot more boring than Dave's. Um, I graduated from Tufts University Dental School in Boston, and I have been practicing, this is my 20th year in Port Huron, and it's so nice to see so many familiar faces. So thank you. Well, great. I thought we would start first with the, uh, the big question that a lot of students and parents have is, how does a student decide if medical or dental school is the right career for them? Uh, Dr. Yindi Saman, if you'll sure. start. Sure. I'll be happy to answer that one. Um, the first thing I would highly recommend is uh, for your child, is they're thinking or considering, you know, is this something good for me or not? Should I be a dentist or a doctor? Uh, go and shadow. Go whether to your dentist or a dentist you know of or someone even just call one of us and say, I want to shadow you. And don't shadow just once. Um, I, I could tell you from an experience in my office, most of the kids that come and shadow us, whether they're in high school or in college, if they shadow us the first time, they're going to walk out saying, there's no way I'm going to be a dentist. I've had few people passing out on me the first day, and I can tell you at least five, they are now happily practicing dentistry. So it's amazing when you go the second time and the third time or even a week or whatever time you want. Um, make sure you really go there and see what we do and see if this is something that you like or not. Another thing that I think it's a big advice that um, if you have a fine motor skills, you know you're good in arts or you have any kind of artistic skills, you might be a very good dentist someday. Uh, those are very good skills to carry with you whether you like whatever it is with, that you do with your hands and you're good at. Um, and lastly, I would say um, if you're a good people person, because uh, dentistry and, and I'm sure medicine as well, you have to be a people person. You have to like people and work with people, because that's, that's what your life is about. Thank you. Any other on, on the panel that want to add anything? Although I think she covered a, a pretty good portion of it. <laughs> All right. The other thing I thought, uh, kind of moving along, uh, can someone give a sense of what a typical day might look like or typical job duties? Typical what? What a typical day looks like as a doctor or a dentist or typical job duties? Just you I mean, as a student, we, uh, we have four hours of lecture a day, so I, I'm more of a standard student where I'll go in in the morning, I'll do four hours of lecture, and then I either, either sometimes you have mandatory stuff, sometimes you don't. Um, if I don't have mandatory stuff, then I'll stay in like post lecture all the material that we did for that day, or you know, looking forward to the next whatever's uh, you know what's coming up, what exam, what we have to do. Um, you know, it's definitely very tough, but it's very enjoyable too. Like you know, once you know you want to go into medicine or dentistry, and you you have that passion, you want to be there. You know, what I mean, like Travis, Sarah, and I have students. Like we really want to be there. So studying and that. Not that it's fun, but it's like you, you enjoy it to a point. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's enjoyable because I treat it like a job. I go in at 8, I study, and I try to be home by 5, and it's, it's really manageable. Like, it's, a lot of people say, like, you give up a lot. You do, but it, it's an enjoyable. Like, I, I go in every day with a happy heart, knowing that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to study and I'm going to enjoy it because I, my end goal is to, you know, become a practicing physician. You know what I mean? So do you guys have anything else? Yeah, I would agree with him in, the, in um, the respect that it's like a job, so I treat it like a job. Um, it's a lot more work than I had to do, obviously, in high school and even in undergrad at University of Michigan. But um, now this is like my only focus. So from like eight to five, I'm pretty much studying. And um, I mean, not every single day, but most days. And um, the cool thing that I think about it is that um, I'm going to be able to apply the stuff I'm learning now. It's not like the algebra and the stuff that I had to do in high school or even college just to take classes. I'm going to be using the information that I'm learning. So when I'm studying from 8 to 5, it's like fun. It, it, it's useful. So that's why, I'm, that's why I'm able to do it. That's why I'm sure we're all able to do it. I can tell you a bit about what my day was like today. <laughs> I. Uh, <laughs> Started seeing patients at 8 o'clock this morning, and I worked uh, quite diligently through the whole morning. I have myself, another doctor in my office, and three hygienists, 
And so there are six time clocks going on a 45 minute or hourly basis and managing what's happening in each of those areas. Uh, I'm helping people with general dentistry, so doing crown preps this morning and helping people with restorative work for fillings and uh, one of my more fun, entertaining afternoon patients was a, a man who's about 90 years old and can't hear well and doesn't remember things, so he writes them down on a piece of paper. And so I got to just interact with probably 40 different people throughout the day, not all in my schedule, but uh, you know I give people shots and take impressions and make smiles. And some people really enjoy that and others don't, and it's my job to make them comfortable in the process. So I work very hard, but I also get to play very hard. <laughs> so dentistry allows me the chance to be there when my daughter has a field trip and I can change my day. I see some head shaking of people who've seen me on field trips with my kids where um, I have control of my schedule uh, for the most part. Today it didn't feel like it, but <laughs> that's okay too. I just want to add something, and I don't work in the healthcare field, I just work in the admissions office, but um, there are so many myths out there about what the typical day looks like for a doctor, for example, because there are shows like Grey's Anatomy and Scrubs that make it look a certain way, and um, I would venture to say that most actual physicians would tell you that it's, it's not really like that in most instances. So this is a good example of a time when um, if you're curious about the field that you want to go into, again, job shadow. See what it's actually like. Um, plus, that will help you on your application down the road, and we'll talk about that. But, um, but at your stage in high school, that's a great way to get started because you might rule it out really quickly. Mm -hmm. You might be sitting there thinking, um, I want to be a physician because I want to help people in the healthcare field. Um, little do you might know that there are dozens, you know, hundreds of jobs in the healthcare field that aren't a doctor. So see what they're like. Um, and you might be able to change your path sooner rather than later. I, I can speak to that just a bit more in that uh, I'm handing, I'm holding a bunch of papers here from the University of Michigan. Since I'm a graduate, they, they didn't send a representative up, but they asked me to sort of represent them tonight. And um, each of you have in your packet uh, a page, and on it it talks about experience and activities written in big highlighted red letters in the corner. Applicants are required to demonstrate a minimum of 100 hours of dental shadowing and or dental related volunteering. So at the University of Michigan, they take that concept of being sure that you really know what you're getting into quite seriously. So, um, and you can, I don't know that that begins in high school or in your college experience, but I know I did do that in those two years where I went back to undergrad. I spent hundreds of hours in dental offices just to make sure that that's where I wanted to spend my career. And it's, a, it's now a required thing, at least at the University of Michigan. Well, and again, depending on the type of doctor or type of dentistry that you practice, there are many different subspecialties within the field. So like our panelists are saying, expose yourself to various avenues because just because you don't enjoy, you know, general dentistry, you may enjoy, enjoy you know, orthopedic surgery or anesthesiologists or, you know, there are a number of different specialists within those subfields. So really, truly explore those options and they'll help you develop that path as, you, as you're going along. And you do not, not have to know those paths going into your undergraduate career um, and you do not have to know those paths, at least in medicine, going into medical school. Um, I'm sure Travis or other medical students can tell you part of the undergraduate medical education, undergraduate meaning after you go to college and you're actually med school, is doing rotations where you're exposed to those. So um, don't feel pressure to know at age 15, 16, 17, 18 what kind of doctor you want to be. Think about it, but you don't have to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a great segue, Lauren. Uh, maybe you can start, uh, explain the process of becoming a doctor or dentist in general, start, starting from maybe high school. Sure. Um, I'm going to go kind of high level surface here because again there are a number of different paths into uh, professional careers as we've seen on the panel. Um, the first step is to get a college degree. So go to college, go somewhere, 
It doesn't necessarily matter where you go. Um, as long as you find a place that's a right fit for you, where you can excel, where you can um, have good relationships with your professors, your teachers, um, and the advisors who are kind of the college equivalent of a guidance counselor to help guide you through. Um, if you, once you identify your path, if, if you're lucky enough to do that early in your college career, then you'll work with your counselor, your advisor, to make sure you're taking the right classes. So I think, like Sarah mentioned, she was art and design, right? And then you had to go back later and do the prereqs, and that's very common. Um, but if you know, while you're still in college, what classes to take, make sure you take those. Um, and then you'll apply to medical school. So just like you're getting ready, or maybe you are in the thick of applying to colleges, sometime end of junior year of college, beginning of senior year, um, you or that summer in between, you'll be applying to medical school. Um, and that process, as I'm sure you all can attest, is quite lengthy <laughs> between taking the MCAT exam, which is the medical college admissions test, kind of like the ACT for med school, um, to application, through interviews which are required. Um, you might not have an answer, an admissions decision, or an offer back from a medical school until spring of your last year of college. Um, and that's to start the fall after you graduate. Um, so it's, it's a drawn out process, but um, but well worth it if you end up in medical school. And then once you start medical school, then you're in med school for four years. Um, every medical school teaches the same competencies. The way they teach them can vary, um, but you ultimately are in school for four years. And then when you get your doctorate degree, your medical doctorate degree, or your DO degree, then you go on to residency. Um, and that can vary from three to eight years, depending on the specialty area you're going into. So. Um, so medical school is lengthy, um, but depending on your specialty, you'll end up with a great career, um, and then you'll be able to practice. That's very surface level. There's a lot more detail to it, but at this stage, probably kind of the path you need to know. But it is, it is a long process. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. Any others? I, I can just add and say it's kind of the same for dental school. Four years of dental school to be a general dentist, and then if you want to do a subspecialty, that would add two or three or four years, depending on the subspecialty. And like Lauren said, college is exploring, I and mean, you might find an instructor that just really lights up, lights you up, and it really turns you in one direction or not. You may decide you want to do one thing and find something else. When you do uh, a shadowing experience, when you um, I, we always tell students to get around the sights and smells of medicine. I mean, work in a nursing home, work in a clinic, do things like that so you can actually see what, you know, feel like, be around blood and the whole part of medicine, the dirty part of medicine, because um, to actually feel like if this is something that you want to do and do it in high school. And sometimes it's easier to do some things in high school because mm -hmm. you have a little bit more time and your time, you have a little bit more freedom to do things. So if you have an opportunity to do things in high school, we actually will take in consideration what people have done as early as high school for volunteering and for things like that. So this is the time to start building your resume. It, whether you build your resume for college entrance, um, when, when everyone's a 3.5, they want to know you're a 3.5 and what else you're bringing to the table. So the more things you can bring to the table, do you go on mission trips? Do you, what else can you do um, that can make you uh, stand out over the other people who are applying for that same position in college? You know? So it's constantly, it starts now and it's gonna constantly be that, per, that you have to gonna be competing against other people. And so you can't get enough uh, volunteerism, uh, shadowing experience to add to your resume so that it can just highlight you over another candidate, and that will be helpful to get into college. And I'm sure, like Travis would agree with going to U of M, you know, the, or Michigan State, or you know, there's we have 36,000 students that apply to Michigan State undergrad. So why, why are why would they pick one over the other? And so a lot of it is is extracurricular and what you're bringing to the table. And uh, Lauren had mentioned that. The, um, our residencies for, for physicians are three to eight years. I just wanted to mention that you do actually get paid during that time. Not a physician salary, um, but yeah, you do get paid. So <laughs> it is part of the, it's part of your medical education. But yeah, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. 
Anne, you kind of started to touch on this a little bit, so maybe um, you could start and the rest of the panel could pitch in. What kind of experiences should the students engage in to make them stand out as that outstanding applicant when they apply? Well, like I said a little bit earlier, we like to see um, stu our docs give back. Um, we like to st see students who are well-rounded, people who um, don't just uh, volunteer you know 20 days before they're going to apply to medical school we like to see a, a life of giving back so and and if, if are you you know it, it could be very you could coach you could tutor you could mentor um you could you know you're going to do national honor society things and you can do volunteer things you can do blood drives there's just so much out there that's available to you that if, if there's an opportunity don't just feel like well this isn't medically related so maybe I shouldn't do it. Do a wide range of things so that you can be that wide, that, that you know, wonderful candidate that has a lot of things. Mission trips, things like that are really great. They really give you an opportunity to see what people are doing in other countries and, and it, really, uh, it really helps build up your resume. If you're going, you know, any kind of uh, languages too. People like, you know, they like to see, you know, secondary languages, third languages, things like that. Um, so, but it's mostly to try to make yourself um, look that like you have a lot of things that you're involved in. And it's really hard when you're trying to keep your GPA up and also, you know, um, get a, do extracurricular and maybe have to hold a job. There's, you know, it's a lot of balancing and it's a lot of balancing when students get to college too. It's like what, how much stuff can I, how much stuff can I do extracurricular and still keep, maintain a decent GPA? Um, and that's the tricky part because when you do volunteering and they love you, they will want you to do more volunteering, and you'll love that because it feels makes you feel good, and you know it's just a it's just a fun experience. But yet that can also take away from things that you need to do your study. So your studies also always, always have to become you know high, but um, but to set yourself apart. And, and what I tell students, medical students when they are uh, students who are applying to medical school. Like start now and start logging it down. Write down things that you do, because college entrance, medical school entrance is all about really bragging on yourself. Ward certificates, all that kind of stuff is stuff you can start accumulating. Put it on, put it on uh, a spreadsheet, keep a flash drive, so as you do something, not to say you're doing it because of that, but it's just stuff that you can start to keep track of. How many times have I been in the dean's list? Have I got any special poster awards? And as you go to college, same thing, you can start collecting things. So then when you're ready to apply, like Lauren said, it's a very tedious thing to try to do all this stuff. You can then um, have all that, pull your flash drive off and go, oh yeah, I did all this stuff, and, and it will help, help you along the way. I think I answered that question. Kind of segueing off that, um, Dr. Yundi Saman, what did you do that you felt most prepared you for dental school? Um, I can tell you I studied hard, like really, really hard. And I know it's a cliche that all your parents are telling you study hard, work hard, but honestly, if you want to be a dentist or a doctor, you got to study hard. I'm sure if I look at all the medical students right here, they know uh, hours and hours and hours of, of studying and then you take a break and then you go back to studying. I think that was the number one. Um, your GPA has got to be high. I uh, took a lot of AP classes, uh, science classes in specific, which I'm sure you will get into more um, as far as uh, clinical of what you're supposed to do. Um, there is the, just like the MCAT for medicine, there is the DAT, uh, dental admission test, uh, to get in dental schools. You got to score really high in that. Um, you really just have to buckle up, and, and, and if you want it, you can do it, but just know that you can't just wing it. It's not one of those things. Maybe we did it in middle school and a little bit of high school at some point, but um, start early. Don't start in senior year or junior year and say, hey, I think I should start, or you know, in college. You, you might want to start as a sophomore or junior or whatever now and say, okay, it's time to buckle up, change my work ethics um, to make it there. Just to piggyback off what she said, it, it really is all about work ethic. It really is because and to do any of these careers, you have to be able to work hard. It's not is that, that you're just so smart you don't have to study. And if somebody tells you that, they're lying to you. They have to study. Like, it's very hard. And it's just about knowing what you have to do to get through it. Like, working hard and it's, 
It's just all it is. It's a grind. It's just studying for the MCAT or the DAT or for your next exam or studying through, you know, undergrad and, you know, that, that stuff is all about just putting the work in. If you put the work in, it'll show and, you know, if you really want to go to medical school or dental school, you can do it with just really hard work. Yeah, and we're in the middle of it right now, and so I don't think we actually know how much we've learned in the past like few years of being in school already. But uh, we have our first years in, and we'll be saying things to them, and they'll be saying things to us, and be like, oh, I do know this, and I remember that I learned this last year, and you, you start to see that you're building this knowledge base, and so that is really exciting for me. Yeah, I don't want it to, I don't know, seem discouraging to know like how much we study um, definitely during undergrad, you still have a lot of fun. You still have the time. You just need to know, like, what you need to do. So when it comes down to it, you got to put in the work. But undergrad was still a blast. Like, I still went to, like, all the football games, basketball games, you know, with all my friends. You still have all the time, but you have to be on top of yourself. You know, your parents aren't there to tell you what to do. So you have to know, you know, when it comes down to it, that you have to study and work hard when it comes down to it. But we're not like locked in a library all the time. <laughs> and keep in mind too, you will have so many resources available to you. Just like you're taking advantage of this program tonight, um, all throughout your college career, you're going to have folks and, and um, support networks for you, advisors, programs, things to take advantage of. So you don't have to be all on your own in figuring out what works for you. Maybe studying isn't going very well. Seek out help from your college or university's tutoring center or academic success center, whatever it's called. So just know that there's always help along the way, um, starting now, if you haven't already taken advantage of it, all the way through college and then um, through medical school, too. So. I just wanted to add one thing, and I always tell high school groups that you can't be more cautious about social media, your Facebook. Um, all the accounts out there, uh, your, your friends, uh, parties that you go to, uh, is, even as you go to college, this, you know, more and more uh, undergrad college are looking at, they, they, they take a look at things like that. Um, if you have, uh, if you go to a party in college and everyone's drinking and, and the police are called, everyone there gets a minor in possession, that has to be disclosed on your application to medical school. Um, if, you get, uh, if you get in a car and you drink and you get a misdemeanor, that has to be disclosed on your application. So all these things, any kind of things, if you cheat on a test in college, that has to be disclosed in your application. The reason they want to have you disclose everything is because if you try to apply for uh, a bo state board and you haven't disclosed this, you, you would be denied a state board. You could be possibly denied a state board. So they don't want to give, spend all this have you spent all this money and then not end up getting a license? Uh, so at this time, it's, it's, I know it's, it's, you hear it all the time from your parents and from your teachers. Um, people are looking, uh, college officers are looking more even at Facebook accounts and at different things like that. So if your friends, um, you know, you just have to clean that up. You need to, if your friends are taking pictures of things that shouldn't be taking pictures of, you need to disassociate with that um, because you can really work hard and then have you know, and then crash and burn because of stuff like that. It's not to say that you won't get into college if stuff like this happens. It's just that you have to disclose it and you have to say what happened, why, what you learned, how you learned from it, and how you're not going to repeat that instance again. So, you know, for, if, if you're thinking about professional school especially, you really have to try to keep your, you know, your life as clean as possible. Correct. Hey, I'd like to hear a little bit more from Sarah, Jesse, and Travis about what your path to medical school looked like and what you enjoy about medical school now. Sarah, do you want to start? Oh, yeah, I'll go. Um, well, before I applied to medical school, after I had done my undergrad, I worked as a doula, which is a labor and postpartum assistant. And so I'd gotten my donor certification and all of my doula training in Ann Arbor. And as soon as I started assisting at births, and you, I'd work with moms all through their labor, and then afterwards as like a lactation consultant, and I loved it. And I, I was like, I need to be doing this every day. I want to know as much about this field as possible. And so then I had to go back and take all my science courses and apply to medical school. So, but that is what brought me. Um, 
right when I got out of high school, I didn't feel like college was for me. I had a family business that I went into, and it was, it was great, and I still think maybe that I would still be doing it today if the economy would have stayed the same. So I decided that I was gonna go back to school. So I went to Macomb Community College, took some classes, kind of got the ball rolling, and then I, I took a physiology class, and I was just blown away. I was like, this, this is what I gotta do. <laughs> so then I, I finished up there. I went to Oakland University, um, you know, studied there for like two years, and applied, well actually I found out about MSU Com, MUC through when I was going to Macomb Community College, you know, and that really was appealing to me, just obviously being right down the road and having everything. So, you know, when I got the opportunity and like, I'm sorry, was Lauren and Ann, they were here to help for us. Like I used Ann's services, I called her all the time. I probably annoyed her a little bit, but <laughs> like I, I used her, her services a lot of like, how, what do I gotta do, what classes should I take and all that stuff. And so going through Oakland and then when I got into MSU Com, it was just, it was sold. All right, so I, when I applied to Michigan, I, like my college entrance, um, the essay that I had to write, like I think I wrote it about like wanting to be a dentist. So like I knew that like I wanted to be in the medical field, um, but I didn't really know too much about it. So like when I took classes at Michigan, I was originally going to be an econ, an econ major, because I figured like if I don't get into medical school, like I want a degree that I would be able to use somehow instead of just like a biology degree. But um, as I continued to take classes and realized that medicine was what I wanted to do, I decided to like have a biology major, uh, just to take more classes to be able to get my GPA up and um, look better for medical school. And um, so during my senior year, I spent, well, we, so we, we took our MCAT after, after my, I took MCAT after my junior year. And then so my senior year was spent applying and interviewing, and um, that was, I mean, that was a lot of work, because I was still taking a you know, full course load, and um, I interviewed, like, in, um, at Wake Forest, which is in South Carolina, North Carolina, um, Temple in Philadelphia, so I was, like, going all over the country, applying to medical, you know, interviewing at medical schools while taking classes, so that was, like, a lot of work. Yeah. But um, when I got into Oakland University, like, I decided that that's where I wanted to go, and, um, I'm having a, a great time there. So. The application process is into, into medical schools is, is challenging in itself. It's just lots of paperwork and just getting everything organized, you said, through the interview processes. But, you know, it's all, it's doable, you know what I mean? Like, you start doing it, you start your application, then you have to do secondaries. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. But, I mean, we're all here. They're practicing. We're, I mean, like, it's, it's possible for anybody to do it. It's just, it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> it's a lot. It's expensive. Yeah. It's really expensive. <laughs> I think what Anne said about like keeping a log of everything that you do is just a great idea. I do that now, and I wish I would have had that when I applied to medical school, because you're doing all these volunteer activities and all these like groups and schools and stuff, and you're gonna forget about some of the stuff you did in high school when you're in college and trying to apply to med school. And it'll be nice to have them all in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a required part of the medical school application. Is um, at least right now, you have 15 slots to list activities you've been involved in, and you have to report the dates, the number of hours, um, and that's for, um, it's called AMCAS, it's the centralized medical school application that goes out to all the schools you're applying to. So um, it's very detailed information. You can't just say, you know, during my freshman year, I was part of pre-med club. Well, we need to know what date you joined, what date you stopped, how many hours a week, and, and a description. So, um, so that is, again, a great piece of advice is to keep a log, starting now. Mm -hmm. Something I found like, helpful was, I mean, I know we were talking about like, joining as many groups as you can and, and um, getting yourself out there, but when it came down to like, the interview process, you have to talk with you know, admissions advisors or faculty, staff at the different medical schools. So like, I thought it was cool, or I thought it was useful like being actually like really involved into a couple different groups or activities. So like instead of like saying you did a little bit for 15 different groups, like being able to really talk about five different things that you did and knowing it through, you know, you know very well, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So you had more to talk about mm -hmm. instead of just, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like dabbling. List. It's a quality <laughs> over quantity yeah. in, in a lot of cases. So there's a balance there. You have to be involved, but 
um, not make it look like you checked it off the list just to apply to med school. Right. So we can see right through that when we're reading your application. <laughs> <laughs> so we've heard of a couple of programs, um, a direct admit program where you could go straight from high school to medical or dental school. Um, and do you have something like that that you well, can address? Well, it's not really right from high school. You have to go to, um, we have a, a program called the Osteopathic Medical Scholars Program. And so if students are interested in osteopathic medicine, um, they could apply. They would have to apply to Michigan State undergrad. And if accepted into Michigan State undergrad, they would apply to the Scholars Program. They can apply, you can apply at junior year of high school. You have to have uh, at least a 3.5 GPA a 28 or higher on your ACT or a 1280 for SATs. Uh, some community services, like I told you, uh, some leadership experience, um, two letters of rec. If you're accepted into this program, then um, they would, you would be uh, under this mentorship for four years. As long as you maintained a 3.5 GPA during this program, uh, you would not have to take the MCAT and you would automatically be presented into the medical school. So you wouldn't have to compete against the 5,000 students that are applying. You would automatically get entrance. Again, you have to maintain that 3.5. So there are people in the scholars program who do not get the, you know, the golden ticket at the end because you you know, you're doing that. But it is a great opportunity for students who are focused and they decide this is what they want to do. They help you do with it. You still would apply. You'd have to do the application process, but they would help, help, help you with letters and all that stuff and just work with you and mentor you as you get through that for the for four years while you're at MSU. There are several programs like that throughout the country, whether it's medical school um, or nursing programs. Uh, what I would advise you to do is as you're going through the admissions process into college, ask those colleges you're looking at if they have a program like that and what the details are. In most instances, at least in my experience, you aren't locked in. So again, I'm, I'm just so careful to make sure that you all, at where you sit, don't feel the pressure to decide right this very moment what you're going to be right. when you grow up. So um, if you start, and I don't know about MSU's program, but I know Grand Valley State has a direct admission program to MSU's College of Human Medicine, similar program, but you can leave if it's not for you. So it just means you're giving up your spot, but if you don't want to be a doctor, then right. don't do it. So, um, so just ask the colleges um, and find out more and just make sure you're not signing your life away or you're gonna have to pay back loans or something like that, which no, is pretty you're right. rare. You're not, you're not locked in, you can always, it's just, uh, it's like if you're gonna do any kind of scholars program, um, just helps you get through. Does direct admit, do either of you know, exist uh, for a dental school? There are some six-year dental school, just like the same programs, yes. Okay. There are. The University of Michigan used to have a program like that, but seven years ago they stopped participating with that. So for that particular school, you do need to go through the regular application process. Okay. I think University of Detroit and maybe Wayne has okay. them. Thank you. Next, I'd like to kind of shift gears and if you were, you have a friend who's applying to medical or dental school or a neighbor or someone you're close to and you're trying to give them, and you know, everyone wants the inside scoop, like how do I do this? What advice would you give someone who is going through that admissions process to be successful? Um, I would definitely say that I think from now, from being in medical school, I think they want to see that you can commit to something and finish it. I mean, obviously tackling medical school or dental school is a huge task and they want to see that you're committed to it and you're committed towards something and you, 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 you're going to start this and then you're going to finish it. You know, because, you know, you, they're investing a lot into you is the same as you're investing into them. So they want to make sure that you can, you can apply yourself and you can, they can, turn out a great doctor or dentist. I mean, so, you know, making sure you can present something on your application that shows that you can complete a task, which is, you know, important, that you can start something and finish it, that you're dedicated, that you're unique in your own way. Like, I think that's good, because they want to see that, you know, that we can finish this, you know, because they've invested a lot into you. 
I would say in speaking to younger people to, um, as we've all said, work hard, study hard, um, get good grades, but also focus on math and science because there are um, significant issues to what will be looked at and where you're headed. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, there's so many things we could, we could share. It depends on the person, too. Um, but I know, and, and Travis can, I'm sure, attest to this, well, as can the others, but um, our first-year medical students often report back, once they're into those hard science classes their first couple years, that, wow, when, when you listed those prerequisite courses, those biologies, those chemistries, you know, organic chemistry, you meant it. We actually did need this information <laughs> to be successful. So, um, so I'll echo that as well. And I would say too, um, you know, in sitting in so many admissions committee meetings and hearing these um, physicians and medical school faculty members talk about candidates so in depth, um, knowing what you're getting into is a big one. Um, when, when we have an applicant that we're not sure they have enough shadowing or that they've ever really been in a hospital setting and we're just not sure that they're committed to it, to use your word, um, that's a little bit of a red flag. So. Um, at some point, just make sure that you know what you're getting into by getting those experiences. A question that I often get asked is, do I have to go straight from college to medical school or dental school? Heck no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, we, there's several of us at the table who went in different directions first and then came back. So, no, you don't have to. Just go when you're ready. Because if you don't feel like you're ready to go tackle it, you're not going to be ready. You know, you got to go in there really wanting to do it. So take a year off. Take 10. I mean, I did it. Yeah, make sure you're really passionate about why you're going, and it'll be worth it. That, that's something, Sarah uses the word passion, and that's something that I've just jotted some notes as I'm listening, is that it was interesting, I don't know Sarah, and to hear her story tonight and say, um, her words were, I've got to do this every day when she was speaking <laughs> about being in a birthing room. And that's a passion, that's an energy that hers came up and said, this is something I want to spend my life doing. Jesse said uh, his words were blown away. He was blown away by, um, the concept of being in a doctor and Travis's words were what I wanted to do and he emphasized the word wanted so while all of these technical skills and the work that's in front of you and the things that are there to be tackled and accomplished they're all very very doable by anybody uh, if you have a passion because the passion for what you're going to do is going to outweigh the workload and it has to or you won't make it and I can add one more if you like they all said, you have to do the science classes and you have to do special things to get you there. If you hate chemistry, it doesn't mean you can't be a dentist. That means you have to work hard and pass that chemistry class because once you're a dentist, we never use chemistry in our real world. So don't let that stop you if you think you want to be a dentist, honestly. You still have to study it. Too bad for you and make good grades and, and excel in it. But it's only that temporary four year where you're struggling in those whatever subjects that you might hate. Uh, don't let that stop you from being a doctor or dentist because in real life, those are not there. But if you I hate use more teeth chemistry. and mouths, probably don't want to be a dentist. <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? If you hate teeth and hate mouths yeah. looking at people and exactly. right. touching people, you probably don't want to go into yeah. that. You want to make sure it's okay to get in somebody's mouth. Yeah, right. that's important. Right. But chemistry, don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's it's true. No, I use more chemistry to adjust my hot tub chemicals than I do in my dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, but the, it's interesting you talk about, you, you said, um, Lauren, for if you hate teeth and mouth. I have a physician who is a patient of mine that I saw a bit ago, and um, he had, you know, we were talking about his circumstance in his mouth, and, um, and I said, well, you, you know, I was kind of surprised because he didn't know as much as I thought he might know about his own circumstances. Man, I hate mouths. I look right past those teeth. I mean, you know, okay, good. So he didn't want to look at teeth. That's not what he does. But he's still a physician. So. It's more of a calling. I mean, we always tell students that, you know, a lot of people, feel like, well, eventually I'm going to make a lot of money, and you probably will make a lot of money in, in, a, in one of these medical fields, but it has to be more of a calling. You really feel that this is something that you can't, you just have to do. And you may not feel that, that this in your seat right now, 
and you may feel it, uh, at, you might not even feel it after you graduate from college. It's, you know, you, you know, you talk to someone who's 18, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I mean, it's just, so a lot of times things change and circumstances change and ideas make you think different ways. And there's careers out there right now that aren't even invented that, you know, you may decide to go towards. But, you know, being a, a, in the medical field, it has to be more of a calling, more of it. I just feel oh, this is what I have to do and I, this is what I was born to do. And if I get paid, great, but I just am excited about just doing it. All right, well, I have one more question in my question bank, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. So start jotting down, get ready. So what happens? This is their passion. This is their calling, and they apply, and they don't get in. What happens? I'll take that one. All right. So I'm, I have some statistics for you, and you may know these, you may not. Um, I'm not here to scare anybody, um, but I do want to make sure that we're realistic because we're, we're up here, all of us are telling you things we suggest that you do or think about, none of which are a golden ticket, none of which are a magic bullet to get you into school. Oh, you have 100 hours of community service in your junior year, you're in. I mean, it doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. Um, so. I will address the question in just a second, but um, this is from the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC or Double AMC. Um, it's a I don't know what's in their packet, but there's a it's a great resource. It's the um, the governing body that oversees all medical schools, at least um, allopathic programs, right? Mm -hmm. Does that Anyway. You have the web address to the AMC in your packet with that included the quotes as well as the American Dental Association. So those are really great web resources that she's referencing. So I'll turn it back over to you for the research that they provide. So I just pulled a couple of things in terms of how many students apply to medical school and how many students get in. In 2012, there were 45,266 people applying to medical school. Um, the average number of applications was 14, by the way. So if you're getting ready to apply to college and you're applying to like three or four or five, and you think that's a lot, the average number is 14 for medical schools. But anyway, um, of those 45,000 students, just over 19,000 got in somewhere or, or ended up going. Um, so that's about a 43% what we call matriculation rate. Now, certainly there could have been some students who were accepted to a medical school and decided not to go for whatever reason. Maybe they weren't ready, personal circumstances, whatever. But generally, it's less than half of the students um, who applied got in. So the chances are that someone in the room was going to apply and not get in the first time, and that is okay. Might not seem okay at the time, but it's okay. There are other paths to take. Um, you can, and some schools like OUWB will talk to you if you didn't get in and will help you strengthen your application for a future cycle. So we'll tell you some areas that maybe you need to work on a little bit. Um, you always will have a pre-med advisor, someone at your college that might be able to help you. So, um, you know, there's lots of things you can do in the interim. You can work, you can go back to school, you can volunteer more, you, you know, whatever it is. And for the students that end up, at least at OUWB, the ones I've heard from that didn't get in somewhere the first time but did the second time, they will always say that it was a blessing, that that extra year or two or five were more important to them than they realized. And so there's always a path. And we do want, you know, none of us want we wanted to make it difficult to be a doctor or a dentist because we want people who have to work, challenge themselves to be this profession. We don't want it to be for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yes, we work with students all the time who apply and, you know, for whatever reason, don't get in. Um, and sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. The class is picked and their name comes up and there's no more seats left. I mean, that, it could be as simple as that. Um, they have, you know, the, the test, the MCAT, you know, is a struggle. It's a big struggle for a lot of students, and, um, and it's not necessarily based on how intelligent you are. It's just, you know, how well you can master that test. Uh, so it is, uh, there, you know, we do have to uh, have a lot of conversations with students on how they can be a better application applicant. And after they apply maybe one time or two times, and sometimes they need to have that conversation with themselves as maybe this isn't for them. 
as well. So again, like Lauren says, we don't want to discourage you. Um, just the reality is, is that it, you know not everyone gets in, and not everyone's going to get into the first choice of your college that you want to go to either. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's bad. It could be that you know you you wanted a Big Ten college and you end up getting a smaller college, and that works out better for you. So um, you know just try to how you know it's just diligence and it's just whatever you know if, if you really feel like I I can't do anything else and then you just have to work hard and and eventually hopefully get in I just got off a phone with someone earlier this week who didn't get into OUWB and he said to me my pre-med advisor said um, that if I took this class at this class and did these service hours, whatever it was, that, that I would get into your school because your school values service. Um, and so I would just want to, I felt sad for that student because he got really poor advice. So I would just caution you against believing someone who tells you that you're a shoe in anywhere, dental school, medical school, whatever, um, because it doesn't typically work that way. I was just talking to Travis. We think there, are, might, there might be some schools where you can pull strings somehow, but, um, but it doesn't usually work that way. Well, I am now ready to, to unleash all of your questions that you've been so patiently waiting for um, to ask this panel. We've given you kind of a broad spectrum, but what specifics do you want to know more about? If you'll raise your hand, we'll uh, bring a microphone around so that everyone can hear your questions. So. C A T like how many times? Yeah. Did you, did we take the MCAT? Um, I only took it once myself. I took it but. twice. I only took it once as well. Mm -hmm. and like did you study a lot, like just for um, since I'd been out of school before I took the MCAT, um, I ended up taking like the Kaplan like online prep course for it and I felt like that did help me out on it. So. And uh, do you feel like you sacrifice a lot of your fa sorry, family time with like people you love and Well, the better question would be directed towards my <laughs> wife over there. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's challenging, you know what I mean? Like you just have to be efficient in your time. You know what I mean? Yes, you do have to give up a little bit, but if you're if you're diligent, like you said, we treat it like a job where I'm in there and then I, I work hard when I'm there and when I'm home I try to be home. I don't try to bring a lot of my schoolwork home. So, you know, it's different for everybody. I mean I mean we have kids in our class that have kids and some people are married and single. I mean, like, so there's all walks. That you, you do sacrifice a little bit, but I mean, you can still manage and have, you live your life while you're going. Yeah, there are definitely times when I miss things that I'm disappointed about, like birthday parties and family events. But, you know, the times I do get to spend, we put them on the calendar, I know they're gonna be there and I really value them. So I think that if I try to focus on that aspect, it's manageable. And just going back to uh, your question about the MCAT, um, it is a, a very difficult, difficult exam. Like a lot of people do struggle with it. Um, I do have a lot of friends who have, you know, taken it multiple times, and I have other friends who have done really, really well on it. Um, I myself, like, I didn't do very well on the on the ACT that you guys are probably studying studying for. Or have already taken. Um, I mean, I guess what I don't consider it well, but like. Um, and I actually did pretty well in the MCAT, so like it's does not correlate with your ACT score. So if like you didn't do well in ACT, like don't let that stop you from like wanting to pursue a career in medicine. Thanks. Middle college versus AP and dual enrollment, and or 
street AP classes and how that helped you with undergrad and uh, in school now? <laughs> okay, um, I actually um, didn't take too many AP classes and um, I actually didn't mind that because the classes that you take, like the psychology or the biology, chemistry, um, calculus, whatever you're in, if you were to have taken those in college, they're probably like the easier classes that will help boost your GPA. That's, I mean, that's my personal opinion. But, because um, like I would rather have taken psychology, which I did like at the University of Michigan because it's an easy A. And, <laughs> <laughs> For you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm gonna put okay, that sorry, out. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. I feel like a lot changes. Like when you go from high school to college. Um, I didn't. I mean, I personally didn't. I feel like I didn't have to like study too much in high school. Um, it's it's um. I feel like I I knew what I needed to do. Um, and I feel like you have. I mean, you have to find that sometime. Um, and when I got into college. There actually was a point to where like I had struggled like a little bit. It was just once I had like one bad semester. I was taking like a lot of a lot of hard classes together because I didn't like reach out to my advisors. So I didn't know what classes to take. I didn't. I felt like I didn't really have the help. I just signed up for classes, you know, followed a piece of paper, like seeing like what I needed to do to graduate. So that's what I did. Um, so my advice would definitely be to reach out and to talk to your professors and. Um, uh, which also helps you because they have to write like re letters of recommendation, and you want them to know you, not just be ri not writing a letter of recommendation for somebody that did well in their class, but somebody that they can actually like, speak for. And um, again, it's like a big change going from high school to college because your parents aren't there. Nobody's making you wake up and go to class, like so you have to figure that out yourself, and um, and really just just work hard. Um, yeah, I don't know. Can you talk a little bit and maybe some other panel members? Can you talk a little bit and maybe some other panel members kind of about high school students in this area have a choice between middle college that they start in the sophomore year and finish their fifth year with an associate's degree versus dual enrollment where they're enrolled in high school and SC4 at the same time versus taking I'd like to jump in, if that's okay. Um, again, my background is undergrad admissions. Now I'm in medical school admissions. And I know this whole middle college um, and dual enrollment world that we're in now is still relatively new. Um, and so I can speak on behalf of a lot of um, four-year undergraduate institutions that we're still not really sure how that plays out um, at the undergraduate level. And as a result, we're not sure how that's really playing out um, for, I'll, I'll speak from medical school admissions standpoint. Um, I do know that, <clears throat> excuse me, our admissions committee will look at a student who has a lot of co um, college credits in high school and they're not quite sure how to interpret that yet. So um, I don't know that there's a magic answer that's right for every student. I think it's important to do what's best for you. Um, but also as someone who has a, um, a college student development background and master's degree and a lot of my coursework was focused on that, we, we at the four-year schools were often worried about a student's development if they enter college um, at age 18 with already 30, 60 credits and then you're done with college at age 20 and then there's just a development. Um, there's just a lot up in the air. So I don't think enough is known yet to be able to offer solid advice on that yet. You're, each of you in the room is, is very different from each other, so you have to do kind of what's right for you with the help of your guidance counselor, your family, etc. And we won't, uh, we don't accept any uh, AP, we will accept AP courses for like English or psychology. We won't do for any kind of our sciences, so we won't accept the, the, any kind of AP courses. So um, the students would have to take. The, so you're uh, saying for your prerequisites, you cannot, you won't accept AP credits for no, your prerequisite courses no. in the sciences. So right. they have to take the biology, the chemistry, the physics at the university. See, and, and excuse me, at OUWB we will 
at least as of now. Now our policies could change any time, but we will accept AP credits in the sciences for any of our prerequisites. So, but every, every school is different. So I think the message is, is that you're gonna have to do the research in, in what is best for, for you and what path your, your student is considering at this point and, and make an informed decision. So when you're looking at those medical schools or dental schools, you're gonna wanna ask those types of questions. Will you accept AP classes? Um, will this challenge me academically? Is the middle college going to be of benefit to me? And, and how do I, I go about those? And like Lauren said, each of you is going to be very unique in how you approach that process and how it works for each one of you. I took some classes at a community college and I felt like I was at no disadvantage than anybody else. I mean, I've got a great education. Some of my favorite professors were there because I felt like I had a better one-on-one -on -one experience. Maybe they you know, put more time with me and I was able to meet with them. I mean, so I felt like it was a great learning experience for me. I mean, and I went there and obviously like, everything's unique, like you're saying, everybody's different in your own paths, but I felt like it prepared me very well, so I would not discourage anybody from saying you have to go to the top tier school. Do that if you're ready and they want to do that, go pray for it. But if, if you had to take some class at community college, I think that, that I was well prepared. I think, I think that's true too, but I think too the question is taking those community college classes during high school before you earn a high school diploma as sort of a replacement. I think that's a little bit of a different scenario. It's tough. It's tough because those are cheap. And you get college for cheap, <laughs> so we know that. Yeah, there's definitely a financial benefit, obviously, if you have college credit and the middle college and all of those things. So, you know, there are a multitude of factors that you, everyone is going to consider when making those decisions. Okay, um, how early in high school can you start job shadowing? Because earlier you guys were talking about job shadowing. So. I can tell you I've had kids that job shadowed when they were freshmen or so, I mean, any year that you're interested, you, can, you can't start too early unless, you know, it will change your mind too fast when it's premature. Okay. If you think you're mature enough to job shadow, I don't think there's a dentist that's going to deny you the, because you're too young. Yeah. Okay. You know, you could start with your own doctor, your pediatrician or your own family doctor. That's always a good place to start because they have a relationship with you and they may, or your dentist, and they may allow you to come in on a Saturday and, you know, see what they do. So, you know, start with people. It's always good to work, to use your connections, you know, use people you know, friends of people that you know. Um, that always just opens the door and people are much more, uh, docs are much more comfortable to bring in someone that, you know, that, oh, I know it's this friend of my friend or my, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, try to use your connections, but usually that's a good place to start. Okay, and my other question is, um, okay, what if you have bad test anxiety? Because I have test anxiety, so. So I'll, I'll address that real quick and then obviously anyone can jump in. Um, kind of our standard line is that if you're going into medicine, you're going to have to take tests kind of for the rest of your life. Um, and so, that's part, of, that's part of the puzzle. Um, not that you can't do it or shouldn't do it, but you'll have to work on strategies to get past that and to do well in order to get into medical school and then to continue on with the boards. And, and so that's tough. And MCAT preparation, a lot of it is, um, you know, the mo you know pr taking a practice, 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 as many practice tests that you get, you do. So you get familiar with the way the test, uh, the patterns in the test and what that all looks like. Um, and, and it's it's one of the things that nobody that people don't want to take a, a whole day and you know can imagine practicing uh, for your ACT for days and days and that's what we ask medical students to do just practice practice set aside a whole Saturday for once a month and and um, sometimes they have to do it more than once especially if they don't do well on the first time and have to ba basically um, try to um, you know, force themselves to get out of that comfort zone. It's just a matter of repetition, seeing patterns, practice, practice, and don't put, don't ever put in your mind that I can't do it because it, it makes me, you know, I'm afraid of that. I have test, test anxiety. Everyone has test anxiety, correct? 
<laughs> Travis told me he has a licensure, uh, a step one uh, licensure exam that all medical students take between uh, their second and third year of medical school. And one of the first things he said to me tonight was, uh, it's six months away. So everyone gets test anxiety. <laughs> repeat the question in case you didn't hear it. The question was what undergraduate majors are looked upon most favorably in medical school admissions or um, which ones prepare a student best for the MCAT and um, I would say there is no preference given for any undergraduate major. I think um, I think Sarah is a good example of someone that Go went with art and was still successful. When you look at the breakdown in the class profile of a lot of medical schools, sure, you'll see a lot of science majors um, because the MCAT tests a lot on science. There's three sections of the MCAT currently, and it's changing, but right now there's a verbal reasoning section, a physical science section, and a biological sciences section. So obviously students who are um, competent in the sciences will do very well, and so if that's been your major, then you know in theory you would do better. But um, an art major can still take all the appropriate sciences and still do very well on the MCAT. So at, at OUWB, and I'm sure a lot of schools would say this, we are looking for a diverse class. And when we say diversity, we're talking about diversity of backgrounds, whether it's major, um, experiences, hometown, you know, what whatever, favorite color, we, no, we don't ask that question. Um, but it's really, we really do not have a preference whatsoever. So pick something you're going to love and excel at, and then make sure you pick up the sciences along the way. I agree with Lauren. We have, you know, we've seen people who wanted to be a ballerina and decided mm -hmm. to, you know, go into medical school. There are, you know, it's, it just depends on if you change your mind and you were gonna go one path, you just may have to do a little bit more uh, difficult work uh, or a little bit more sciences. Um, but you wanna go into, uh, you know, college is exploration and you wanted to do something, you may go in and have no idea and then you decide to go one way and change and go somewhere else. And I mean, I just talked to a student yesterday who is gonna be finishing his degree, uh, his pharmacology, to, you know, he's gonna be a pharmacist and he's applying to medical school now because he's decided, I don't really wanna be a pharmacist. And so, you know, you never know what, you know, we've talked to students, and I'm sure Lauren's the same, we talked to people like Jesse who, you know, they're an engineer and, all, and they've always had a passion to think about being a, a doctor and they go back to school and do some prereqs and apply to medical school and start all over again. So there's really no one path and we do like to see students who have other things that they're just not kinesiology majors or something like that. Um, I, I, I try to discourage people from just going into a pre-med program because if they decide to change or go some, if they don't go into medical school, then they don't really have anything to go on, you know? So to try to stick with something, but uh, yeah, you can get this to this place in various ways. But somewhere along the line, you've got to rock out the sciences. Yeah, yeah. somewhere in there, you got to fit it in. Got to like the sciences. Choose a major. Yes. That includes all the three ranks. Um, someone already asked a question kind of similar to this one, but I was wondering about like the IV diploma, if that has any more weight than like AP classes, because my school recently eliminated all AP classes but one. And I'm involved in the full program on the way to the diploma. Does that carry any like weight at all, any consideration? Um, I don't know what Ann would say. Um, at OUWB, again, we accept credits like that if they fulfill prerequisites. We don't see a lot of IB but, um, or International Baccalaureate, but we get them and we accept them, but every medical school is gonna be a little bit different. Um, I mean, I would venture to say that what you do in college matters more than what you did in high school, but again, there will be some medical schools that may not accept um, college credits in that kind of way, so it right. just depends. And I already mentioned that we, you know, just the sciences that we we like to see the sciences, that you actually do the sciences. And I think it's good to have that. I mean, you need to have as, as much, you know, if you're gonna to go to medical school, you need to really be proficient at the sciences. So, you know, that may be a problem. 
Um, and my other question is kind of for the students. Um, when along the way do you find out that you can kind of handle, like, kind of, you know, kind of cutting into a person, I guess, because I was thinking about being a surgeon, but I'm not exactly sure if I could handle having someone's life in my hands. When exactly do you realize that you can handle that? <laughs> I guess I don't know if I can. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> we don't know, yes. I mean, we ha I have an anatomy lab. I'm not sure the way they do their anatomy to where we do work with cadavers, but they're not living people, so I don't know. Did that we like have medical students that report back that they're still, even a year into anatomy, are still squeamish. Um, so. We had a, one of our third years now, so was a my upperclassman, who is an amazing, I mean, the guy, just talking to him, you can tell he's an amazing doctor. And he went to what's called a preceptorship, and they had to do a procedure, and he fainted right on the floor. <laughs> so I mean, he'd like, you know, I mean, I never would have thought he would have, but as mm -hmm. soon as they, they did it, he fell right on the floor. So that happens. I think you you get desensitized to it as you go along. I think having a doctor though who regard remembers that you're still human and still gets a little squeamish about that. I know that personally makes me feel a little more comfortable <laughs> that, that they're not like, all right, here we go, chop saws coming out, ready to go, you know, like that they're, they're recognizing that this is a, hu you're, it's a human life that you're cutting into. So, so I don't think that, that that's a bad thing to have a, a little bit of squeamishness as a result. And that's partly why you go through rotations and, um, you know, clinical rotations in different specialties, maybe you don't end up wanting to be a surgeon. Um, maybe you end up in a specialty where you don't have to cut so regularly, so, yeah. There are lots and lots of ways to be in medicine where you don't cut somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Or, see any, or see any patients. I mean, if you're a radiologist, you might not even be with human contact. You're just with your x-rays, so. Regard to the uh, school which they uh, have program after high school, like University of Detroit Mercy, you said, uh, Dr. Samman. Do you I can't hear. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. the program. You mentioned that there are some schools in which you can join their program after high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they still have uh, require the MCAT or they waive it? Do they still have what? I'm require sorry? the MCAT after graduation, oh, like in the undergraduate, or um, do they waive it? I honestly don't know because I didn't do the six-year program, but I wonder if Anne would be able to answer that. The que and I and I I'm, uh, are you saying? I, I guess I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Do they still I, have to take the MCAT if they're in a direct admit program? For our program, no. For our program that uh, if they were accepted into our osteo -schol our scholars program, which I have, I have information that'll be out there, um, and they maintain the 3.5 GPA, they do not have to take the MCAT. I'm sure it differs from one school to another too. Chris has one first, and this one, okay? will be next. Go ahead. As far as pre-medicine classes go, I've heard that if you mix in some engineering classes, it'll benefit you. Do you find that true? Is that for the students? Yeah, anybody, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, everything's gonna help you. It's gonna, you know, are, do you need it? No. Like, I never took anatomy before I went into medical school. I took anatomy, and I didn't find, but I mean, is it going to help you? Yeah, maybe the way that you approach things and think things through, maybe that could help you. But like, as far as specifics to, you know, calculus in medical school, no, because I would not be in medical school if that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer it? Good. Yeah. So I had a question about job shadowing. I've tried looking around for job shadowing lately and it's very hard to find doctors that are willing to let you shadow due to confidentiality. So how do you expect us to job shadow when it's hard to find a doctor that's willing to let you do it? Um, should, 
Okay, if I were to answer that question, and of course, um, the dentist part, and I do have a lot of kids that do shadow, college or students, um, and yes, confidentiality issues are an issue, so what we do is, I walk in the room first, they are not even in the room, I introduce, I let the patient know, okay, I have a student today, you know, third year high school or whatever, they are shadowing, is it okay with you? And if they say no, then the student stays outside. And if they say, sure, no problem, and I think in all the years I have had, I don't think there is one person that said no to me because they know me and they trust me and so they're actually willing to tell stories and the next thing you know, they're telling them too many private stories <laughs> to the student that maybe they shouldn't. But, but you, we always have to ask the patient and get their okay first. Um, and if that's the case, then we introduce them by first name and, and they walk in and really the students usually don't care who you are, they just want to know what procedures they're doing. So we've never had an issue from my end of the, of the story with confidentiality once we do that step. As did, you far try, as did you try to do like yeah. your own family doctor exactly. or things like that? Have you tried look? Yes. And they, they said they wouldn't do it? Yes. Keep knocking on doors. Yeah. yeah. Keep asking. Yeah, I felt like I ran into that issue even in college. You know, I was at the University of Michigan with a huge hospital there, and I didn't really know what to do. And then I just ended up emailing, you know, tons, tons of doctors before somebody, you know, finally said yes or, you know, connected me with someone who would do it. So even if they can't, then ask them, you know, if, any, if they know anyone who might be able to, you know, let you shadow. And the other way to possibly get started is that some of the hospitals will run volunteer programs, and while you may not directly be shadowing, you'll get some exposure and you'll make some of those connections. And by making some of those connections, you may be able to then make the ask a little more personal rather than you know the phone book or internet or you know an email. So that might be one route. And those that exposure in a, a hospital or a clinic or anything also will start to help you understand what that daily life kind of looks like. So that might also be a, another route that you could potentially take. Um, if you, you said you like apply to like 14 med schools, so like once you get uh, like undergraduate, what if like you get accepted to like only a school like that's way out of state or you didn't want to go to that, like what do you do? Should you hold off for like med school or should you just go for it? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a super personal question, and, and we work with students all the time who have those tough decisions to make, and I would venture to say a lot of students would just say go for it and do whatever it takes. Um, but really, um, you know, I would say from a transparency standpoint, out of respect for the medical school, if you have no interest in going to California for medical school, don't apply to California schools just to rack up offers. I, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. You know, each school is always looking for something different. You know, I mean, like you said, you might just not be a fit for them. So definitely apply to a lot. And if you get into one, great. Accept that. I mean, because you might not, like the ones you're holding off for, maybe you don't find out until late. Like I got into school before I found I got an MSU, and then as soon as I found out I was an MSU, I was done with that other school, but I had full, I was going to the other school until I got into another one, you know? So definitely having more options and letting you make a decision of where you want to go, you know, is, is a nice decision to have. And if, you, oh, if you only got into one and you, it wasn't your top choice and you're holding out for another, unfortunately, if you wait a year and try again, there's no guarantee you'll get into any the second time. So it's a really tough call, and I would say if you want to be a doctor, you should go if you get in. Well, and you have to also have to be concerned. I mean, people talk about going to, like, the, the Caribbean medical schools, things like that. And you really have to be cautious about, you know, you... You need to ask a lot of questions and you need to make sure if it's too good to be true, then it's too good to be true. You know, if, if no one in the United States wants to invite you into their medical school then, and, and someone else says it's not a problem, you just need to check it all out and, and um, be careful about where you're going to go. Uh, look at where, uh, what, what's their matching rate, what, you know, do, are people getting residencies who graduate from this school? or what kind of hoops you have to jump through to get a residency. Because it's, you know, you're in school for, you know, two years and then you're in rotations. You know, the ultimate goal is you want to get to play, you know, you want to be a doctor and, and have residency somewhere. And if you can't, get, you know, end up going through all the cost of medical school and can't get a residency, that's a problem. So that, you know, always ask the, the right questions and make sure 
that you know it's it's a, a good fit for you. Um, my question is mainly for the students, but it could go for the doctors also. Earlier, you were talking about how you have a passion for it. How do you keep your passion alive and know that you won't become bored of it? You know, my passion is definitely obstetrics, and I have to learn so many other things. We're in cardiovascular unit right now, and sometimes it's really hard for me to stay focused in it. But then I'll just take an hour and like read a journal article about something that I'm interested in. Or I went to a conference like two weekends ago in Denver. And for me, those events are so invigorating. And even though they're really few and far between, I feel like if I can like work them into it, like other things that I'm doing, then I can really keep focused and keep really excited about what I want to do. Yeah, I definitely, I try to do shadowing. Like I have, I would see once it's, it's Ironic that it's easier to do a lot more shadowing once you're in medical school already. Like you were saying, it's hard to get somebody to shadow, but like I just shadowed somebody in the ER, and I just was, it gets me so inspired to that I'm there seeing patients and I'm seeing what your reaction, your end goal is. Like I come back from that and I'm, I'm kind of recharged to, to want to continue to study. And I think from a from a working perspective, um, there are going to be days that you're just not having a good day in general, that the whole day is boring, not just the work part of it. But somehow, when you have the passion, it's such, at least in my opinion, dentistry is such a rewarding profession that even if I'm walking in going, oh my God, I have a whole day and I have 20 patients to see or whatever, the first person or the second person you see that you see them smiling or so grateful that you've done whatever you've done for them, all of a sudden you get your passion back. So I think the day I am not passionate is the day I should be retiring. This isn't really a question, maybe more of a, a comment. You talk about job shadowing, but aren't there also opportunities to observe uh, surgery and things like that, like at Oakland University and um, maybe some of the medical schools where they actually have observation decks or things like that that are available for people? It's a different experience in job shadowing, but at least to give people an opportunity to you know, experience a surgical procedure. Maybe you could speak a little bit to that. I'm sure there are those opportunities. Unfortunately, I don't know how to go about getting those. I mean, Beaumont Hospital, with which we are affiliated, does, it's a teaching hospital, has been for more than 50 years. So I'm sure there are definitely ways to do that. I wish I had the details on how, but, um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, we see applications from students who have those experiences, so certainly they're getting them somewhere. And I don't, I, we, we don't have anything that I know of that could observe that. We have a program. Um, it started as a pilot last year with, um, at our site at Macomb, uh, and it's called the Future Docs Program. And it's, um, it's an application program where we accept 30 students. Um, and the application, and I, did, I do, can uh, allow students here if they would like to apply. Um, and the program is, allows students to, uh, it starts in January and goes to May, and every, it's um, every other week on a Saturday from 9 to 12. Uh, it's a free of charge, and if you're accepted in the program, you will then be able to go to, um, you'll be able to go to like the medical, last year we went to the medical examiner's office. The students then got to, you know, hold a, a, a brain and lungs and a heart and watch them dissect that. They went to um, the Providence Hospital and they got to play with the Da Vinci robot. They went and they got to suture, practice suturing. They, they went to uh, uh, ENT docs and got to uh, learn about that profession. They went to um, uh, uh, Henry Ford Macomb and they learned, uh, talked about, uh, there's just, uh, there's, you know, various <laughs> probably seven or eight different docs that work with uh, this program and um, it's, it's an amazing uh, experience for the kids, and it's we t we're taking students from 10, from age 10, um, grade 10 to 12, and I think the I think it's the 28th. I did leave some applications, but it's the 28th of November that the applications have to be in by. Um, but you guys, all your you know high school students who are interested are welcome to apply um, for that, and that kind of gives you a little bit of taste of medicine, 
and uh, it's not, you know, what visualizing a surgery, but uh, if your child gets in, it's a, it's a great opportunity. Pardon? Oh, it's called Future Docs. Future Docs, and it's with MSU Com at, over at, in the, at our Macomb uh, site. And um, we, it's a pilot program that was last year, and this is our second year. <coughs> and the, the course starts in January 25th, um, but you would have to apply. Students would have to apply, uh, and I think they have to do an essay. And it's like a certain GPA. It's like 3.5 certain uh, GPA and um, kind of what else you do, extracurricular. That's what we look for. Uh, and um, that's all. And so, and we, but we choose 30 students. So I, we sent it out to a lot of uh, high schools in, um, down in the Macomb area, and um, so we, you know, we'd like to offer it, obviously, up to you guys. We, we only can take 30, but we're gonna do it again, so hopefully, if, we don't, if, you, if you get selected, it's an opportunity. It's a nice opportunity to get to see a host of medical careers. So if anyone is interested in the future doc programs, Know How to Go has the applications. Ian left those with me. So I'm happy to be the connection if you're interested in applying for that program. Right, I'll email her the applications tomorrow and then she can send them forward to the schools so that um, you know, you'd have to go to your advisors or we can, you can, uh, I can give you a card and you can uh, uh, send, ask me um, and I'll email you a, an application as well. Well, I'd like to thank our, our panel of experts this evening and for all of you for being so attentive and asking such fabulous questions.